And we're back with our panel. CBS News congressional correspondent Nancy Cordes covers the Democratic campaign for the network. Ed O'Keefe is with The Washington Post. Ben Dominich is the publisher of The Federalist. And Jamel Bowie writes for Slate magazine and is a CBS News political analyst. Nancy, I want to start with you. The largest mass shooting event in uh, American history happens in the middle of a presidential campaign. How do we think this is going to play in the presidential campaign? At the very least, it's going to put a pause on politicking for a while. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump both had big political days planned for tomorrow. It was her first big general election campaign day. She's going to be out in Ohio, then heading to Pennsylvania, making the case about Donald Trump. He's supposed to be going to New Hampshire, uh, giving a big speech, kind of a retort to her foreign policy speech, talking about everything that he sees as shady in her background. So the question is, how do they change their plans? It doesn't feel like uh, the kind of day that you do a big rah-rah speech. Beyond that, uh, typically after events like this, you pause and have big conversations about terrorism, big conversations about gun laws. In this case, it's a little complicated because based on what we know so far, and we don't know that much, but it sounds as if this suspect had weapons licenses, had a security guard license, didn't have a criminal background. So it's not as if this is someone who wasn't supposed to have a gun and had one. And what Nancy says is exactly right. The politics at the professional level will pause. But we live in a world now in which social media is already galloping. There's a self-sorting that goes on. People have already decided what this is well before the facts have come in. Uh, One people shows it as a moment to talk about gun control, another about terrorism. Uh, How do you think that sorting plays out? Well, and and not only that, it happens at a gay club during Pride Month on Latin night. So you, you can draw all sorts of conclusions about what may have happened there. I think for those that are wondering, can we do something about this? Let's just pause and remember that 20 kids were killed a few years ago in Connecticut and Congress did nothing. College kids were killed at Virginia Tech. Congress did nothing. A congresswoman was shot and paralyzed, and Congress did nothing. Now, in the midst of a fractured Congress that isn't doing much of anything these days, uh, and in the midst of this presidential campaign, one wonders whether there will even be a real substantive debate about this in the coming days. Nancy and I were both there in 2013 when they tried to do gun control. Uh, It fell apart. And things have only gotten worse politically since, so you wonder. But to Ed's Ed's point, there is not policy X or policy Y that necessarily would have stopped what happened. In the sense that, uh, in the larger sense, John, evil men will always exist. They will do evil things. The victory over evil is not something that is within our capacity to grasp. And so it's the fight that counts. And I think in this context, that fight is an ideological fight more than it is over policy X or policy Y that would have removed small arms from this man's hands and spared these lives in this instance. What's your take, Jimmy? I both, I'm sort, of, I'm sort of in between these two positions because it's certainly true that for events like this, it's hard to imagine a particular policy that can prevent specific events. It's just sort of, that's not how policy works. Um, people like this will always exist. Even under a tight regime of gun control, there's going to be events like this just because we live in a free society. On the same token, because we don't really know what what the motivation was here. I'm reticent to say that this is some kind of ideological struggle. We don't really know what it is. Um, The fact that this did happen at a gay club on Pride Month suggests something. The fact um, that we know for a fact that uh, groups like ISIS are encouraging lone wolf attacks suggests something else. There's not enough information out there, I think, for us to make any kind of conclusion about how to go forward. The concern I really have is that liberal society is going to fray in response to these types of incidents because you have these over and over again, these small arms massacres, and then a policy response that I think the people feel is either insufficient or actually targets the victims, taking guns out of their hands or engaging in policies that are not actually going to prevent these sorts of things in the future. I'm not sure that we've figured out a response to this, and I think that that helps these active uh, folks in in the Middle East who encourage these types of terrorists. And a rush to judgment can contribute to that fraying, and so we are going to do our part and not rush to judgment. So let's stop from this horrible tragedy for a moment and talk about the presidential race as it existed beforehand, if that's still possible to do. Um, Nancy, on the Republican side, Speaker Paul Ryan, you cover uh, Congress, said some extraordinary things about Donald Trump, said his comments about the judge in the case were textbook racism. 
What's your sense of the feeling on the Hill among Republican leaders about their party's nominee? I think what they have discovered is that it's much more effective to sort of air their criticisms about him in public than to try to influence him behind the scenes. That nudging behind the scenes clearly doesn't work. If anything, it provokes him. So what they've decided, and it's not just Paul Ryan, but it's Mitch McConnell as well, they're kind of airing their dirty laundry, which is something that these Republican leaders have never done in the past, especially Mitch McConnell. But they've decided maybe if he hears enough voices, for example, saying it's a bad idea to talk about the judge, then that will influence him. And we've seen that it does have an impact. He has stopped talking to the judge about the judge that much, not because people were telling him, you know, behind closed doors he had to stop, but because he heard enough voices from his own party saying it out in the public. And I think, you know, off the hill, John, he's, he's going to continue to have some issues. The fact that you asked Corey Lewandowski, is he going to apologize? And he said, there's nothing to apologize for. Uh, that right there, I think, is enough for certain people who may have considered voting for him out in the country to say, well, then I can't. I spent time this week in Las Vegas talking to voters. And, uh, and you know, I, I was struck that there were actually a few younger Hispanic uh, people I spoke with who said, he makes some valid points. Um, and there are elements of his life that I find admirable, but he's racist, and I can't vote for him. And I think that will continue to hit, you know, be a ceiling of some kind for him with certain Americans who will say, you said something wrong and you didn't apologize for it. In society, when you make a wrong, you apologize. If he's going to refuse, that's, that's going to be a non-starter for a lot of I, people. I think there's an extent to which Republican leaders might be fooling themselves about the kinds of man they're dealing with in Donald Trump. The the idea that you can sort of pressure him and urge him to just be different, I think underestimates that this is just who he is. Donald Trump is someone who plays on uh, racial prejudice and who plays on um, racial suspicion to, to get votes. I'm reading a couple books about Donald Trump, because that's what you do, I guess. and. <laughs> It's striking to see that in the late 80s and early 90s, he's talking the exact same way. This is not sort of a lark. This is, this is just who Trump is. And so this attempt to say, well, maybe if you just stop saying the, the prejudice things, things could be a little better. No, Donald Trump says prejudice things. That's who he, that's who he is. Ben, it seemed like the crucible of Paul Ryan was on display this week. He tried to put forward a poverty plan that he cares deeply about that he spent a lot of time on and couldn't get to those remarks at the event scheduled around that poverty event. But because first he had to say that what Donald Trump had said was totally antithetical to the tenets mm -hmm. of the party. Corey Lewandowski said, well, this isn't something voters don't care about. But Paul Ryan does. Yes. How does Paul Ryan and the Republican Party deal with those conflicting things? I, I think you saw uh, Senator Flake trying to deal with it in his conversation with you in the sense that he says, you know, this is a real choice. This is one that ma uh, matters. Certainly he's correct about that. But it's one the voters within his own party have already made. They made the choice to side with Donald Trump. Any other candidates would have spent the past week talking about a terrorist jobs report, talking about Hillary's latest email problems, uh, talking about, you know, the poverty plan and things of that nature. Instead, Donald Trump spent it defending his remarks within this context. I think that Republicans just have to make peace with the fact that uh, that for all of these elected officials, especially those who are up for election in this cycle, they're going to have to be answering questions like this all the way to Election Day, and that's not going to change anything. And talking about Mitt Romney all right. weekend, mm -hmm. not talking about Hillary Clinton, talking about Mitt Romney calling him a choker. And I think what Paul Ryan is doing in his interview with you and in all of these big policy speeches is he's trying to lay a groundwork so that in mid-November, when the dust clears, if Donald Trump is not victorious, he can say to the country, this was not the Republican Party. This was Donald Trump. The rest of the Republican Party is headed in a different direction. You know, there was nothing to see there. Continue with us, because there is going to be a reckoning if Donald Trump is not the leader. And, and Paul Ryan is trying to create the sort of anti-Trump message now. Ed, let's switch to the Democratic Party. Hillary Clinton is now the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party. Uh, there used to be talk of disunity in the Democratic Party. Where do you place the... Uh, the measurement on the unity quotient. Well, I, I think Party. this situation in Orlando may, may play a role in, in figuring out exactly when and how Bernie Sanders ends things and, and when and how he meets with Mrs. Clinton. He's, he's apparently going to do this Tuesday night if, if the plan holds. Uh, that will be after the District of Columbia finishes things off for, for all of us across the country. Um, you know, at this point, it appears he is more interested in, in trying to get some policy concessions and some changes at the convention. Uh, it does seem like there is support for that. Again, even talking to Voters, again, in Nevada this week, there was a lot of hope that she would somehow embrace elements of his, of his legacy uh, or his, his campaign. One way to do that, some Democrats did say, was Elizabeth Warren, perhaps. One guy called 
her the Bernie Sanders woman, or she is the, the female embodiment of Bernie Sanders, and maybe she should pick him. We'll see if that happens. Uh, that's still a, a little ways off. But um, it was striking to see that she had a very good week, probably, probably the best week she's had yet. And, and I think they were hoping for another good one. But again, the situation in Florida may complicate that. John, one of the big questions, I think, coming out of this uh, uh, situation in Florida is uh, what people take away from uh, disruptive and chaotic events w around the world. Uh, in the past, we've seen situations where this has helped candidates who have uh, a bit of normalcy about them, a bit of status quo, a bit of confidence in terms of their ability to be commander in chief. This time around, however, we saw in San Bernardino that helped uh, Donald Trump. You know, Paris helped Donald Trump within the context of the GOP primary. It remains to be seen whether that plays out within the general election as well. Jamel, 30 seconds. Hillary Clinton said in her speech, um, she wants to build bridges, not walls. Did she find her message in a general election in the way she didn't have one in the primaries? I think she may have. I think what's so interesting about Hillary Clinton in this moment is that we've never actually seen her campaign against Republicans in a national way. And so I think this is giving her an opportunity to kind of be aggressive in a way that she couldn't be within the context of either fight against Bernie Sanders or really Barack Obama in 2008. All right, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you, Jamel. Thanks to all of you. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.